Okay, good morning. Um, I'm all ready for looking forward to another day. I appreciate the um, uh, good interaction that we all had yesterday. I thought that, uh, it was a nice opportunity for you all to let me know what you're thinking about and um, what are some of the issues in your mind. And uh, I would encourage us to do the same again today. I, uh, it was a, from my perspective, I do all kinds of workshops and, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things if you finish the first day of the workshop and you walk out and you realize that, that you folks would have said nothing, those are not good workshops. So those, are, those, are not, those are not happy days. So. Um, <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, the, somewhere in the middle. Um, okay, so in the, at the end of the day yesterday, right, people remember where we were at. So, so we kind of went through this set of activities that we would use for anger management. So we um, did a practice of how to use the puppets. Um, we did a, a practice, of, a brief practice of uh, how um, we would do that kind of uh, role playing if it was uh, without the puppets, right? So we did we did all that. Is there any questions about that? Because we we did spend some time about talking about that about important clinical issues related to it. So what I'm going to do here is is um, cover a little bit more of that, and then I'm going to. Uh, have a task for you guys. This is an example with the puppets, by the way. This is an older example. In this meeting, we are going to begin to learn how to control our tempers by playing a teasing or taunting game using puppets. Here's how it works. One group member will take his puppet and step into the circle. The other group members will pretend to tease his puppet using their puppets. Instead of getting angry, the puppet in the circle will think out loud. That is, remind himself that he can control his temper. Watch. Look at your tie, it doesn't even match. Look at those clothes. Did you find them 10 feet underground? Those puppets don't know me. I can ignore what they're saying. They just want me to get mad. Chill out. Take it easy. I don't have to get mad. Dork. You look uglier than my mom's casserole. Man, you need to brush your hair, man. That's snappy. You have to, uh, your fur looks like spaghetti. Man, your fa man, my, my mom's spaghetti looks better than your face. Look at that tongue. What do you do, lick boogers? He probably eats his boogers. Yeah. One day, his fur got all dirty because he got flushed down the toilet, I hear. <laughs> Those puppies don't know me. I can ignore what they are saying. They just want me to get mad. Chill out. Take it easy. I don't have to get mad. Oh, shut up with your big head. You got the idea, right? Um, so um, after you have the activity, then what we do is ask questions like this. So this is what we would um, talk to the person about who was the receiver of the teases. And if it's one of the kids who's actually the one who's doing the teasing, we ask them questions as well. So what did they feel about? Um, so one thing that came up yesterday, for example, was the point that the uh, person, it uh, might have been you, Amanda, but whoever was um, doing the teasing when the puppet didn't respond to that uh, talked about how you know that was kind of frustrating for that not to happen. So when that happens spontaneously, that's really great because that's, it's like one of those key points where um, uh, it's not quite that we're teaching our kids to be more passive aggressive, but sort of we are. It's better to be um, uh, using their uh, desire to exert control over people in that kind of way uh, in frustrating the other person's uh, aim rather than trying to use physically aggressive behavior. So, so we ask questions about um, what was the puppet I'm going to turn off this in case this is. What was the puppet thinking or saying to himself or herself? What level of anger did the puppet experience? Uh, what kind of skills? So we talked about distraction, relaxation, uh, coping statements. 
and um, what other feelings? So did the feeling did the uh, uh, puppet feel scared, for example? Did that come up? So we also suggested yesterday that there were, uh, we'd be careful about the kinds of taunts that are used. So we talked about how to prescribe them. You start low on the anger on the anger thermometer, pick out ones that have uh, relatively low va valence, especially when you get into live uh, taunting. In addition to that, um, we do have rules, and these are just absolute rules that um, uh, that are in place and that kids would get strikes for if they use them. So uh, no cursing or swearing, no racial comments, um, no physical contact, and uh, at least in any kind of routine way, we eliminate the yo mamas, right? Because those are kind of automatic, it's, it's like an audit code for an automatic response, and uh, um, it doesn't work quite in the same way. So the child may not care much about their mama, but they're still gonna respond. So, um, so there's some tips here. Um, uh, as we were going through yesterday, the therapist, the group leader always models first. Um, uh, when the kids are doing the role play themselves, uh, a good thing for us to do is to coach the child, especially uh, early on, if it looks like they need it. And if you have two group therapists, that helps. Uh, so one thing that the child can do is to write down on a list what some of the coping statements are that they could be using. And they could, uh, if, if they're struggling to remember these kind of things, encourage them to write them down and they can pull it out and use those as prompts to themselves. And then uh, we've talked quite a bit about this issue, about creating a hierarchy of anger triggers. So that's a, what we would consider to be a, a real key part of this sort of exercise. And also yesterday we talked about if you're observing that a child's looking uh, uncomfortable at a level that uh, looks like it's getting too high, you just end the task for that person at that time. So it's always under your control. You just end at that moment. Uh, so in the workbook, uh, page 42, um, there's a listing here. Kids can write down um, as many coping statements uh, on here that they can think of. And so we want to uh, go from a verbal discussion within these group sessions about what are some of the coping statements that I could use to actually having them write it down and in a sense make a commitment to these are the kinds of things that I'm going to try to use the next time this comes up. Um, some uh, therapist uh, will take these uh, coping statements for each child, put them on a small card, and laminate them. Uh, kids could put them in their pocket, can carry them with them in some way. Uh, I think that's actually a good idea. Uh, so we've talked about uh, relaxation uh, being an important component here. And um, as I talked about yesterday, I actually am a real believer in this because I think that the arousal, physiological arousal that kids have co-varies with these hostile attributions. So the more you think that people are out to get you, the more your body's activated. And if you only try to change the cognition, it's not going to work. You have to, you have to work on how our body's doing. Oh, it's uh, relaxing. So um, how many of you do deep breathing with some of your kids, abdominal breathing? Okay. So many, most of you actually, it looks like. So um, um, the way we do it is we just um, ask the children to put their hand here at the, kind of at the bottom of the, where the ribs are, so right, right in that area. And then um, we have them breathe in. And the, one of the key things is to try to keep their hand from moving out. So keep your hands still when you're breathing in. And then that drives your breath down deep. Uh, some therapists uh, have told us they have metaphors for that. Some of you might have that, like you, you imagine you have a balloon in your stomach or something and you're, you're blowing down into the balloon. But you're trying to drive the, the, the breath deep. You're trying to get away from the shallow breathing, right, which is often going along with being aroused. And we know that if kids are successful at this, if they can slow down their breathing with these deep breaths, there is a physiological response. There's something called a vagal nerve and a uh, vagal response, which uh, 
leads to a relaxation uh, uh, moment for these kids. So it's, it's key that they do it, they do it right. So when I'm doing it with the kids, I'll do something like, uh, uh, okay, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. So I, in my own mind, when I'm doing that, I'm trying to, um, uh, as I go along, do the breathe in and breathe out. And my example here, I don't think it was that great of one, but I try to get the breathe out to last longer than the breathe in because you're trying to increase the uh, carbon dioxide in the system, reduce the amount of oxygen in the system. And again, that's going to help to, re to relax. So you, you do it slowly, and then you especially have a long breathe out spot. And you just uh, repeat it. So you can do it eight or ten times with the kids. Um, in the manual, uh, the way it's currently set up, we don't come back to this very often. And uh, we ask kids whether they've used it, but we don't come back and ask them to do it again in the session. And um, uh, so as mentioned yesterday, we're working on this early adolescent version of the program. It's led us to kind of think about a few things differently. And this is one of the things that we now recommend uh, is that actually practice take place for the next several sessions after this so the kids can get uh, better at it, get it more comfortable at it so they can use it. So the, the really nice thing about abdominal breathing is that this is a form of a relaxation response they can do. Yeah, so they're on the bus and something's frustrating happening. Well, they can do it there. You can, you can do it kind of privately. People don't exactly know what you're doing. So it's a very portable um, uh, method. Uh, people who've used it, any problems with using it with kids, introducing it to kids, any uh, other little tools or techniques for making it work well? Amanda? In John Rice's depression, they all were kids sort of anxious about trying this kind of thing. They do a role play where you go practice it out in the waiting room at the clinic or some public place. Uh. They call it secret calming. I always I like that idea because you know again it's something it helps reinforce that idea that you can do it without losing face or without being embarrassed. Right. So it's kind of like a task, isn't it? A challenge task where you you send them out to do it, but in a safe place. Is that right? And a public place so that they can get the idea that like nobody really knows that you're doing it. Ah, that's a concern for that. But yeah. Like, you know, that yeah. But I think it's it's important. It really is important as part of a treatment package with these kids. Okay, um, so uh, yesterday we were um, uh, up here doing some of the uh, puppets. Okay, everybody, some people I know had to leave a little bit early, but we did a practice with puppets. Uh, so I'd like for everybody to do a brief practice right now. And we don't, you don't have puppets. I don't have enough puppets for you all, but this is going to be your puppet, right? And so pair up. And um, uh, one of you be the, the person who's going to receive the taunts and teases and think about what it is that you're going to do. What, what kind of methods are you going to use? And then the other person um, gets to tease you about something about your puppet there. Yeah, so, so this is going through puppets, right? This isn't person to person. So your hand is your puppet. Use your imagination here. This is your puppet. Yeah, yeah. Huh. What, what's that? Okay, if, you, if you've done it one way, reverse it. So the person who was the receiver now be the giver. So reverse the direction. Okay, okay. Well, let's, let's pause here for a minute and just do a little processing, okay? Okay. Um, Okay, let's, let's pause here for a minute. Um, how was it? It was fun. It was fun? Okay. It is kind of fun. It's a good thing to do as a therapist to have fun every now and then. Um, was it um, hard or easy to keep it going between your puppets versus between you and the puppet? Were you able to keep it that way? Okay. So I, so I noticed that a few cases, people kind of dropped their puppet, and they were starting to talk to the other person's puppet. And of course, we don't have really have puppets, so that, that kind of takes away. 
But when you're doing this, work real hard, you know, to keep this third person part going early with the kids, right? So always, and this this is a tendency. These kids are gonna, they'll do it for a while, but then they're gonna want to start doing it the person. So so you have to keep uh, monitoring that, shaping that as you go along. Actually, there was a good question even before we started, and that sounded like there might have been a few issues here. So one issue that sometimes come up is that the child who's um, practicing self-control with the puppet um, uh, begins to talk back to the other puppet. And like, oh, you think you're tough. I'm not, so, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, did anybody run into that? The tent start to happen a little bit? So that can happen. It's really easy for kids to, to move away from the point where they're supposed to be thinking these things in their head. So what they're saying out loud are just like the thoughts that are in their head. Well, that's you know, even for fourth and fifth grades, uh, kids, that can be hard sometimes. And it's easy for them to slide into just taunting back, teasing back, getting into the game, you know, in some way. So, uh, again, it's something to monitor. Once you notice that's happening, then you want to stop it at that point. You know, not uh, just gently stop it and kind of uh, explain again what the task is and then restart it. And then um, this is one of the things we're turning... Uh, the puppet, and then when we're doing ourselves, away away from the uh, person who's doing the, the teasing or taunting helps a lot, because then it's clearer to the kids, I think, that whatever's being said while you're facing the wall is really meant to be your thoughts and not, not a verbal interaction with the person who is going with you. But it's, it's a really easy thing for it to slide into, so you really have to watch that carefully. Other, other things that you ran into that you noticed were hard, or it could be hard. <laughs> yeah? Well, uh, no, you were, you were just talking about turning it. I like that for the therapeutic session, but should we be leaving, letting them leave with that frame of mind that uh-huh. turn? Because when you're, I'm thinking again, our rough schools, yeah, yeah. where if they turn their back, then right. they get jumped. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good point. So you're, what you're doing is, you're saying for this activity, right, when we're doing it right now, we're not suggesting this is what you're going to do out in the real world, right? in terms of turning your back, that for this activity, let's do it. And once you think kids have it, then you know you can go back and have the puppets or people more face-to-face, because it would be nice to get it to approximate closer to what's in real life. But at the beginning, when it's hardest to get it down, that's when I think it's most useful to turn away. It's a good point, though. Yeah? Yeah, that's really what you want to do, is, is you want the kids, um, after you've gotten it down, is to, uh, it's, so it's the classic Mike and Bomb sort of thing, where they're now taking these things they were thinking about, and they're saying them in their head. Now, the trouble is, once you do that, you have no idea what they're actually thinking. So, you know, I don't do that very quickly, because I really want to hear what it is that they're saying. But kind of at the end, that's where you want it to go. Who are doing the teasing um, start to get frustrated because they're not getting any response from uh-huh. the person who's the target? Do you have them also practice what to do when you get frustrated? Well, we've not, but that you know that's that's another whole you know that that uh, I mean you could carry it that far if you wanted to if you were you could you could make the point that boy when you are teasing you know, it can be frustrating when somebody else isn't responding. But right, I think on this task, the focus is so much just on the receiving and that this is the, you know, putting all kinds of spotlights on um, the use of self-control by this person. And it gets, so it gets a little more complicated, I guess, to say what, be a self-controlled teaser, you know, and I don't know quite how to uh, deal with that. So, so I guess the more I think about it, I'd probably steer away from it, unless it was much later, yeah. Is it worthwhile to um, have them before they start the exercise to think of the specific statements that they want to say to themselves before the thing starts? Or right. So that. Or just spontaneous. No, I, I I think that this is a big issue. Yeah. So so the um, I mean the first time or two I think it's okay for them just to do it free, especially with the puppets, you know, because they're they're just kind of get the idea sort of down what they're supposed to be doing. But the more and more uh, you practice it, you really do want them to have certain specific statements that they're 
saying that they're going to use. You know, they're committing themselves to that and then they practice it. So, uh, again, we were talking yesterday about how the more you practice something and the more automatic it gets, so the more you can say what it is you're going to say, say to yourself and then you practice it, you know, then that increases likelihood of automatic response later on. Yes. In our role play, what we were saying was mean, but the affect wasn't. And yeah. there's something like you said, and we tried laughing because it just it was so creative. But in a real situation, you probably wouldn't be laughing. Right. Because it wasn't as authentic. Right. Well, yeah. So, so actually, the teasing is not quite what really goes on in real life. And yeah, and that's even even when you get to the live uh, activity, it's still not quite, you know, really. Uh, but one of the side things there is this issue that we've kind of talked about yesterday too, which is this issue of, of the teasing games that kids do play. Uh, you know, they get a lot of fun out of it. You know, they, it, it's playful. And for kids who are good at it, it's actually uh, kind of a social skill. You know, they get uh, peer respect <laughs> for being able to do this well. The trouble is um, there are individuals around them who are not good at it. And then they feel victimized and, you know, all that kind of thing. So, so um, as we do the activity, I think we want to steer away from uh, rewarding kids for being good teasers, even though we might think it's funny, whatever they're saying, you know, and really, again, focus on the person who's using self-control and getting, demonstrating self-regulation. That's uh, really what we want to see going on here. Any other questions about this? Yes. Um, I, I kind of uh, think the same thing along the lines as uh, she had mentioned was um, part of the lesson is to teach one, the focus is to teach one to kind of tune out the distractions. But um, again, I'm thinking about the, the kids that I've worked with before and they are in PPE programs and they're, you know, they've got fighting issues and that's the biggest one, you know, the anger management. And um, I, I feel as though letting them leave without addressing again alternative ways, because like she said, one might get kind of irritated that he is ignored. Uh -huh. And in the real world, when that uh -huh. happens, it doesn't just, they're not just telling me uh -huh. I was frustrated. They're, they're like, uh -huh. that, that made me mad. I'm so like, you would rather you would rather give that person, the one who's, who's the teaser, who's now frustrated, a, a kind of a behavioral script. Is that what you mean? Or, or um, also kind of like, brief, you know, different ways of getting frustrated. Is this the right thing to do? When you see yourself doing this, find an alternative. You know, kind of talk to them about alternative things to do when you start feeling mad yourself. I, I feel like yeah. there's maybe two lessons in there, not just the one. Well, the, the, one, the one issue here, so, so one of the tensions I think we had in trying to even create the program originally was we're aware that, um, you know, by getting into this material, this is only part of what is related to socially skillful interactions, really. It's being able to manage yourself in the moment. And that's true for the person who's regulating their emotions as well. You know, that's, that's not enough in the long run. You have to do more. And that the whole problem-solving work needs to be done. Um, but it's not possible to do all of that at once. And so for us, the way we manage that, but it's really related to your point here, is that um, so we're, we're going through this uh, material here. Let's see where it comes next. Yeah. Um, so we uh, end this kind of unit by talking about essentially behavioral scripts. So uh, suggestions for what kids can do um, when they're using these self-regulation tools. And we say, you know what we're going to do in a few weeks, we're going to talk about uh, different uh, ways to really think of lots of different choices about how to respond. But before we get there, these are just some things that you could think about doing. So we're not doing problem solving in the traditional sense where you're brainstorming, because that's another whole activity. But what we do try to lay out are what are some of the uh, uh, things that you could do to handle some of this uh, uh, distress that you have, because it's not finished, really. You haven't learned new skills. So I think actually when you finish here, you want to do that. You want to give uh, feedback certainly to the kids who are receiving the taunt, who are practicing self-control about what then can you do. So I've survived the moment. I've done the 20 seconds. And now what? Yeah. So give them an idea of what to do at that point. But then I, I think you know you could comment upon the, the teaser too, that uh, 
you know, frustration can occur on both sides and, and tie it in that way. So there are some materials. There's a handout that goes through some um, activities like this, things that you could do to essentially help regulate your affect more, settle yourself more, that you can do uh, later after uh, an arousing situation has occurred. And, um, and then some fairly specific uh, behavioral things. So like walking away and that kind of thing. So the point though is that this is not meant to be the point where we do all the problem solving and think through the pluses and minuses of each of these. We just say these are all possible things that you could do. Um, does that answer your question enough or did you want to elaborate more on that? But I, you know, I, th I think it's actually right. I mean that's actually what you have to do at the end of this. Um, other questions about anger management or about this unit. So it's one of the key things to do. Oh, uh, this opportunity to talk about what it is that you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So, so this kind of gets into all kinds of other issues. This gets into issues, for example, walking away. Well, that's not an easy thing to do, right? No, I mean, uh, so there's there's a whole social skill around this. So this was. Uh, so one of the groups that I had, um, that I was working with, uh, had a boy in, a, in the group who was uh, about nine or ten, and um, he was having some recurring problems at school. So every, every other week or so, he'd get in a physical fight and go down to the principal's office, and this was a problem. Um, the fight was always with the same person, and it was, it was a girl in his class who knew how to tease him. And he... He just couldn't. He couldn't stop himself. You know, it'd start to happen, and then it would escalate, and he'd get up and he'd re react back. So it really wasn't widespread, but it was one person who had his buttons. So this issue came up, and he'd had a, another incident this last week. So he comes into the um, group setting, and we're talking at the beginning. He was a pretty open kid. He talks about how this has been an, had another problem. And um, so he had this other boy who was in the group who was uh, kind of like Fonzie. So does anybody know Fonzie? <laughs> okay. So he was this uh, uh, really smooth uh, kid who was well respected in the group, actually. And he said, well, you know, I think you should just walk away. That's what you should do. You should just walk away. And then the kid says, well, I tried that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So he says, uh, well, let me show you how to do it. So. Um, so, and give me a hard time about my tie. <laughs> Three important behavioral skills that I tried the best that I could to portray there. So what were they? What, what did I do? Swaggered. Swaggered, uh-huh, tried to do that. Not quite like that boy, but you get the idea. Okay. What's that? Okay, I didn't. I didn't affect, right? I didn't. It was uh, like a smug affect. Uh huh. So. I'm fine. Right. So, so what I tried to do was actually more behavioral than that. It might have come across as that, but what I did was to look at you, before turning away, right? So he, this was a key thing that he did. You know, he he looks at you and then he turns away. You don't want to look too long because then you're in the interaction. So you have to look short and then turn away. But that's uh, so it's a cue that I'm not just running away. I'm not fleeing. I'm not doing this out of weakness. I'm deciding to do this. And then in the midst of swaggering, I was walking away slow. Right? So that's the other thing. Your pace is under your control. So the boy thought, well, that's cool. So they practiced a lot. And, uh, uh, and he was able to use that uh, with peer reinforcement. So I, I think what happens is some of these are actually useful things to do, but they require a lot of work. So and we can't do it all at the same time. So I think we can bring it up. Uh, we can say these are things that you could do, and we're going to talk a lot more about this stuff. So it's uh, just being introduced. Just being introduced. Can you hear me OK? OK. So now we're going to um, start on a new topic. And we call the topic um, perspective taking. And it's um, trying to address that hostile attribution bias that Dr. Lachman was describing yesterday, that many of these children have a tendency to 
kind of misperceive or over-attribute hostile intent, even in the face of maybe some pretty benign cues from another child or another person. And um, it's intentionally placed here as a lead-in to the problem solving what to do next so that the child can slow down, try to see where the other person might have been coming from before they figure out what to do next. So we have a couple of um, activities here that are meant to be a fun way of getting into this topic. So go ahead and um, take a minute and look at this picture. How many of you have seen this before? So most of everyone has seen it before. The fun thing is, is um, very few of the children have ever seen this before. So often they're seeing it for the first time. Um, so how many of you can see kind of a young, beautiful woman with a plume in her hair? Okay, so many of you, but not all. So maybe I'll come around here. Oh, do we have a, we have a pointer here. So I'll try this. So this would be her hair, and then a feather coming out of her hair, her eyes and eyelashes, and then chin, maybe like a fur wrap here. Okay, does everyone see that? Okay, now does anyone see anything else in this picture? Okay, okay. So does everyone also see an old lady in this picture? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, I'll let you to take a minute and try to see it for yourself. And then, um, and then I'll show you. So this is um, where I see it, at least. I don't know if I have the right answers here, but I, this would be her chin, like a pointed chin, her mouth, like a mole, her nose. Up here is kind of hair, maybe a scarf over her head. Does everyone see that? Okay. So why didn't we all see the same thing when we looked at this picture? Why didn't we all see the same thing when we looked at it? Everybody has a different yeah, everyone has a different perspective. With the kids, we might say everyone kind of has their own way of seeing things, might have been focusing on different parts um, of the picture. And so we had um, kind of differences of what we saw here. Here's another one. So take a look at this, and if you see what might be there, don't go ahead and call it out right away. So we'll um, just take a minute and look at this. So I know that when I looked at this for the first time, and, and typically when we show the children, they start looking at these black um, things here. So they might see an arrow here, or a house here, or Legos, and they come up with all kinds of interesting things that they see here. So this is a projective test. Um, but what else is in this picture if you look at it in another way, okay? So if you actually look at the white space instead of the dark space, you can see the word fly. Okay, so if you look, here's the F, the L, and the Y. Y'all see that? Okay. So why didn't we all see that the first time we looked at this picture? Yeah, so we were focusing on only part of the picture, the dark spots, and not the white space. So we'll kind of use this also as a fun way with the children to say often there's more to the story or to the picture than we see at first if we just take the time to look at it more closely or in a different way. And then we'll say the same thing can be the case in our relationships or interactions with other people. There may be more to the story or even a different story altogether than what we thought was going on if we take the time to see it. And we'll tend to um, send these pictures home with the kids to use on their friends and family members too and they get excited about that. And um, then there are a number of um, other activities that we use to also continue to raise this concept of perspective taking. Perspective is a big word for many of these children, especially if you're working with um, younger children to understand. So I'll kind of interchange that with point of view or way of seeing things um, that is often easier for them to understand. And um, so one of the activities is what we call a roving reporter activity. So um, we'll show the picture, the children some kind of stimulus picture that depicts um, a potentially ambiguous situation and let each of them um, take a role of one of the characters in the picture. And we ask each of them to make up a story about what was going on with their character at the time that the picture was taken and that the action froze at that point, but they can make up a story about what was going on um, with their character up until that point. 
And then one of the children is assigned the role of a roving reporter. And they really have fun getting into this, pretending that they're holding a microphone. And they get to go around and one at a time unfreeze each of the characters in the story. And it works best if you can whisper or even take one of that one character at a time out of the room and interview them about what was going on, um, if there was a problem, what was the problem from their point of view, how they were feeling, and what they thought was going to happen next. And the roving reporter can record that either with notes or if you could on a little tape recorder. And um, then they'll kind of refreeze that person, bring them back to their spot and refreeze them. And then do the same with the other characters until they have the story from each character's perspective or point of view. And then the roving reporter um, gets to have the fun role of summarizing each character's story for the group and uh, the similarities or the differences in perception of what we're going on from each character's mindset. If you were to use an audio recorder or a video recorder, you could actually watch that back. And that's really fun because it really emphasizes that um, each character may have had a totally different story or perception about what was going on here. So we often use um, do so cards. How many of you are familiar with do so cards? Um, so they, they're a set of cards. They're somewhat similar to the second step cards. How many of you have second step cards? But you could also tear out pictures from uh, magazines or any other stimulus picture that depicts a social um, situation that may be of interest. Um, so this is an example of a do-so card. And um, let's just pretend that you were the one who was playing the character of this boy holding the baseball bat. Um, what are some different reasons or different stories that you could make up for why he's sitting there and looking like that? That he's been excluded by the group? Okay. He's tired. He's just, he's been having fun with them. They were letting him play and he's just tired and taking a break. He's supposed to play well. Okay, so he got out or didn't have a good hit, so he's frustrated. He's just, he's just waiting his turn. He's not particularly happy or unhappy, he's just waiting his turn. He feels sick, so he's taking a break. Yeah, okay, so he was playing, but now he's waiting for his mom. She's about to come pick him up. Preoccupied about something that happened. Okay, so he's thinking about something else that happened, not related to. Okay. What else? Okay, so how do we know which of those is right? We don't know. Yeah, so. So we can use this to foster discussion that we're often just making a guess about how someone else is feeling or what's going on with them based on some of their um, facial cues or body language or what's happening in the situation. But we really don't know for sure. And it, I think we came up with at least eight or nine different explanations and we really don't know which of those it is. Um, so we kind of use that discussion in this game activity to kind of illustrate that we don't want to overly assume that we know exactly what's going on with another person, that we want to take time to kind of check it out with them and find out more before we um, assume that we know what's going on. And that in itself can help to prevent problems or solve problems more readily. Um, so this is a similar example. So we have some kids who look like they're up in a um, clubhouse here and um, someone who looks like a little girl down below who looks like she's throwing something up at them. So um, what we would do in this case um, for another activity is actually record their responses for all of the different reasons why this girl might be throwing um, something up at the other kids in this clubhouse. So let me get something to write this down here. Let's see. Okay. So. What are some reasons you can think of about why she might be throwing something up towards these other kids? Okay, so she's mad at them, getting back at them. Okay, so she was trying to be helpful to get the ball. Okay. Okay, let me just catch up so we have. Okay. We're playing a game. And then you just said, can you say that again? They wouldn't let her join them. Okay. Okay. So she's mad because they wouldn't let her join them. Okay. 
Any other ideas? Okay, she's a bully. Somebody else um, dares her to do that. Okay. Okay, I had an interesting response the other day. They said this was part of their initiation ritual, and as soon as she made the ball up, she could come up and be part of their club. <laughs> but it's not a ball, it's a tomato. A tomato, that's right. I think we made that up. Any other ideas? It's, a, it's an all-boys club, so she wants to be... No, there's a girl. <laughs> I think there's at least one girl up there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, we had, she's trying to get them a snack, but unfortunately she missed. <laughs> they really wanted a tomato for a snack. She's um, on an opposing team and she found the enemy's lair. Ah, okay. So it's, okay, so it's a game and she found... She doesn't like tomatoes. <laughs> Okay, so we have a nice list here of two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different motives for why she could be throwing the tomato. Did you have another one? Maybe she was walking by and he threw it and she was going back. Okay, so she was just uh, trying to get it back to them, but unfortunately she missed. Okay. She wants to join the baseball team. <laughs> and she's trying to show them what a good, what a good thrower she is. <laughs> So she's practicing her or showing off her baseball skill. Okay, so what we would do here in another activity um, that we call the motive in the hat activity is we would write down all of the ideas um, that the group members come up with for uh, different motives or reasons why um, a character in a picture might be doing what they're doing. And then you would tear their um, answers onto strips of paper. I'm going to tear your answers here. And then um, if I could have a volunteer. Do I have one volunteer? So someone different from yesterday? We didn't have to call on anyone yesterday. So it would be great if we... <laughs> Okay, super. So what we're going to do is kind of um, play a charade-style game where if you're willing, you can um, pick one of these strips blindly and then act out the motive on the strip. And y'all, the group members here are going to have a job, which is to try to guess which of the um, motives that she's acting out. And the trick is you're going to have to do this... Um, acting charade style, so without any words or sounds, just with your body language, okay? And I'm going to whisper something to you. <laughs> so, I'm writing quickly. Okay, so we'll mix these up. Okay, we'll mix these up. You can pull one and, and look at it. Okay. Can you read it okay? Okay. So you can come on up here and y'all watch what she does and see if you can guess which motive she's acting out. Okay, so we'll cut your acting right there. It was great acting. So what do y'all think? I heard she wants to join. What were some of the other guesses? She's mad because she can't go up. She's mad she can't go up. The initiation. She's trying to... It's the initiation. Okay. She's begging Okay, so you said she wants to join. So what were some of her um, body language or movements that made you think that's that's what it was? So the 
putting her hands together made it look like she was begging. Okay, were there any other uh, cues that caught your attention? So this, what did that mean to you? She was trying to get them to let her know she wanted up there. Come on. Okay, so it looked like this gesture kind of looked like begging or asking to let her up. Okay, her, she was kind of bouncing. That looked like a sign of either eagerness or some kind of emotion. Okay, were there any other cues you noticed? She was kind of happy when she threw it, like she kind of or something. Okay, there was a little kind of slap or stomp that may have been some anger. Okay. You want to go ahead and tell the group which one you were doing? I was initiating into the clubhouse. Ah, I think that's it. Great job. Okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. So what, what gestures were you trying to do to show that? Oh, they, they all mentioned they it. Like, okay. Excellent, excellent. Great. So we do this activity. You can have a seat. Give her one more hand. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll actually repeat the activity several times, giving um, each of the children to have a chance to act out a different motive and discussing um, what some of the body language or cues were that we look for to, to guess what the motive was. Um, but we also want to convey that um, we can't always tell. So were y'all certain which one she was acting out, or did you feel like it was just maybe a guess? And that's really how it is in our um, typical interactions. It's one of the messages that we want to teach, that there are some uh, clues that we can get from their body language, but it's still hard to know. And often they have a hard time guessing the motive um, correctly, so y'all are um, great clinicians, so you um, picked up on that well, but the children don't always have an, an easy of a time doing that, and that's okay. That's one of the messages that we want to send, that sometimes it's difficult to tell, um, and we may even guess wrong what's going on with the other person. Yes? In the previous activity, where the person was doing beauty to the kid, how much of that was the same thing that the In the um, previous activity, uh -huh. we with the roving reporter. Mm -hmm. you know, how much uh, do you let the kids play that out and, and how do they know what they're playing out to each other in the story? Right. Really just for a short time because you don't want them to each give too much of their story away. And that's an example where it really helps to have a co-leader because they do, they're spread out across the room and particularly while the roving reporter is freezing and unfreezing them and taking each one to the side, it's a time that's important to monitor the other group members and what they're doing during that time. Uh, so that's where it helps to have a co-leader who can be circulating the room. And you'd want to pick the child who played the roving reporter well, someone who you thought could really handle that job and do a good job summarizing the differences in um, perception as well. I'm going to grab one of the child manuals to read that story. Okay, so we have another activity called the wise men activity. And there are a couple of different ways to, to do this. So I'll read the story first and then we'll describe some of the other options. So I have a story. Um, it says, conflict is as old as time itself. People have always tried to make sense of the world and understand each other. At times, this is difficult because not all people see a problem in the same way. As you listen to this old Indian tale, see if you can discover the cause of the wise men's misunderstanding. Once upon a time, there were six wise men living together in a small town. The six wise men were blind. One day, an object was brought to the town. The six wise men wanted to see the object, but how could they? I know, said the first man, we will feel it. Good idea, said the others. Then we will know what it is like. So the six men went to see the object. The first man touched something that felt big and flat and moved from side to side. He said, it is like a fan. The second man was feeling a different part of the object and exclaimed, no, it feels like a tree trunk. The third man shouted out, you are both wrong. It feels like a thin rope that tapers at the end. Just at that moment, the fourth man pricked his finger on a sharp part of the object and yelled, it is not like a rope, a fan, or a tree. It is like a sharp spear. I just pricked my finger on it. At this moment, the fifth man called out, no, no, this is like a high wall, strong and sturdy. The sixth man did not agree with any of the others. He stated that the object reminded him of a snake. 
It was long and cylindrical and moved around in many directions. The six wise men argued and argued and could not come to an agreement as to what they were touching. Can you help them to discover what it was they were touching? Okay, so if you've heard this before, don't call it out right away. But if you haven't, do you have any guesses about why um, the six wise men each thought they were touching something so different? <laughs> Do you have any guesses what it is? Okay, if you have heard or you think you know, you can say no. It's an elephant. Okay, so did any of you guess that on your own? Surprisingly, some of the children do get it, even when they haven't heard this before. But um, so we had the first man said it is big and flat and moved from side to side. It's like a fan. So what part of the elephant would that be? Ears. Their ears. Okay. So the second man said, no, it feels like a tree trunk, his legs. Uh -huh. And then the third said, um, it feels like a thin rope that tapers at the end, the tail. And then um, the next said, it feels like a sharp spear. I just pricked my finger on it. The tusk. Uh -huh. And then the fifth said, it feels like a high wall, uh -huh, the side of the elephant in the body. And then the sixth man thought it was a snake, long and cylindrical and moved around in many directions. That'd be the trunk. That's right. So why was it that the wise men were having trouble agreeing on what it was that they were touching? Yeah, they were blind, so they were relying on their touch, and they were all touching different parts of the elephants. They were missing what? What were they missing? The big picture. Yeah. Um, so we kind of use that as a fun example. So you can read the story like that and have discussion that we um, like we had here. Um, and it's, it's also fun. It's typically the first time the children are hearing this story, so they enjoy it. And, um, and then there are some other options where you could um, give each child a picture of just the um, part or the object that each of the wise men were describing and see if they can put it together and guess what the larger object might be. Or you can ask them each to, um, to draw uh, assign them each one of those parts to draw and then put it together and see if they can um, guess what the larger object is. And then regardless of how you do the activity, you also want to follow it up with discussion about um, why it was difficult to agree and how they um, came to a process of agreement. Okay, so this is another example of a do-so card that shows a possibly ambiguous situation where we could come up with a variety of different explanations for why this boy might be walking by and not stopping when the other kids are asking him to play. So what, what reasons can you think of for that? Okay, so he's got some cold groceries that need to get right home. He didn't hear them. Okay, he didn't hear them asking him to play? His mom told him to be home by a certain time, so he's hurrying. He doesn't know the other kids? Okay. New to the neighborhood? He looks very upset. He looks upset? Okay. So he's up. His groceries are heavy. He wants to get home. Uh, he's grounded, <laughs> so he has to get home. He can't play. He doesn't want to get in trouble. It looks like they might. Yeah, if you can see the picture better, they're actually throwing a rock and breaking a window. So he may know that they're doing something wrong and doesn't want to join in. Okay. Okay, so they might actually be calling him a name or teasing him. So he's trying to use his ignoring, walk away. So this is another example. One picture, and we have at least you know nine or ten different explanations for why he's doing what he's doing. This is another stimulus that you could use for either the roving reporter or the motive in the hat activity to talk about how it's often difficult to, um, to know exactly what motive or intention another person has. Um, and then also, um, part of that discussion, which of those motives do you think the children um, are most likely to come up with? Yeah, yeah. So like the girl throwing the tomato, they may be more likely to think that she's mad and, and throwing that because she's mad to get back at them rather than, oh, she was just trying to get them a snack and she missed. So they may be more likely to come up with the first explanation. So if that's the case, you want to point that out, that that came up in their discussion and that, um, and that, that you know, the, the hostile intent is not always the correct one. 
and that we want to take the time to think of other possible intents or explanations. And then the last point here is just to acknowledge that we don't always know. Sometimes it's not clear. We don't always know why other, we don't always know why we do the things we do, let alone know why, um, why other people um, choose some of the actions that they do. And then um, there's another really nice activity in the section on perspective taking, which is um, to have each child interview their teacher. So it's meant to be, um, has a couple of purposes. It's meant to foster um, a positive interact one-on-one -on -one interaction with the teacher. So often these children are the ones who are um, getting in trouble in class a lot and may have quite an adversarial relationship with their teacher. Uh, so it's meant to be a brief, it can be 10 to 15 minute one-on-one um, -on -one time with their teacher. We give the teacher a heads up about this, that it's coming a couple of weeks in advance and what the purpose is for the um, child to get to know their teacher a little bit better and to understand the teacher's point of view or where they're coming from. And we also have, there's a list of questions that you'll see that are provided and we typically try to give those questions to the teacher in advance so they have a heads up about um, what's coming, what the child's going to ask them, and can think through their, some of their answers in advance if they'd like to. And the questions have to do with things like um, what school, what elementary school was like um, for the teacher uh, when, when they were in school, what was similar to how school is now, and what may have been different about how school is now. Um, so there are a number of questions about that, including what some of their favorite memories were, um, what they didn't like about school, so the students are always interested to hear about that. Um, and then also what um, middle school was like for them as well, and some similarities or differences from, from school now. And then um, there are also some questions about um, what it's like to be a teacher now and what the teacher expects um, for the students in the classroom. So it's a chance for the children to hear that the teacher um, really has the best intentions for the students in mind that they care about them and want them to learn. And when they enforce rules or um, give them a low grade that they're not doing that to be mean, it's because they really are trying to teach them and help them to learn. And um, then they also ask them about what their goals are if a student disrupts class or breaks a rule, what the teacher's goals are for the class, which is to restore order in the room and to help make sure that all of the children in the room have a chance to learn. Uh, so this can be a really nice opportunity for the um, children to um, hear some of these things from the teacher and to bond with them. Um, it can be difficult, so we'll actually role play in the group session prior to this, just the actual process of inviting the teacher to do the interview. Um, that alone can be somewhat intimidating to the students, so we'll talk about um, when would be a good time to ask the teacher to do the interview and then practice making eye contact and inviting them to do the interview. And then we'll actually practice reading the questions aloud so that they have practiced um, reading the questions. And there are some spaces for them to add some of their own questions. And they really enjoy getting to come up with some of their own questions to, um, to ask the teachers. Um, they can record all of the teachers' responses, but they don't have to. We'll actually send them with a um, tape recorder so they feel like a reporter and they really enjoy playing with the tape recorder and um, recording their name on it. And then if they do that, it allows you to um, play it back and listen to parts of the interview in the session. In the, the follow-up session, you can talk about what it went and what they learned about their teacher, what surprised them to learn about their teacher's point of view. <coughs> Did we have that on the tape or no? I wasn't sure if that's what this slide was. Okay. So there are a few practical challenges in making that um, teacher interview happen that um, sometimes it's hard for the teachers to um, find the time to do the interview. So we try to help problem solve around that um, and suggest that perhaps the student could sit near the a teacher at the lunchroom or stay back from a few minutes um, on the, of another class during the teacher's prep period to do this. Um, and sometimes the school counselor has offered to fill in in the classroom for a few minutes so that the teacher could do the interview. Uh, we have had situations where if more than one group member had the same teacher, um, they could double up and interview the teacher together. So I think that's an acceptable option, um, but if possible, it's always better for the student to have um, that one-on-one -on -one interaction with the teacher. 
Um, and if that's not possible, another option would be to have one teacher come to a coping power group session and let the students interview the teacher in the session. Um, so that could be another option as well. Mm -hmm. We try to guide them toward their main teacher um, because even if they have an adversarial relationship with that teacher, it's nice for them to um, maybe see that teacher in another light or have a more positive interaction with the teacher. Um, but if that um, doesn't work out or we have concerns that it may not go well just based on what we know about the teacher, it's okay to steer them toward a favorite teacher or a different teacher in the school if needed.